Hello, good morning, good afternoon. I hope you all who are joining us virtually today are well, healthy and safe. And it's so wonderful to see um, so many great faces coming into the chat as you already begin to introduce yourselves. Welcome everyone to an era of power reckoning, trust-based philanthropy and the implications for documentary film funding co-hosted by the Trust-Based Philanthropy Project and Color Congress. We wanna start off and thank our partners and colleagues at Grantmakers for the Arts and Media Impact Funders for their help promoting this event among their membership. It's wonderful to see you all in the room today. Um, an important accessibility note, you can access the live CART transcription for today's conversation by clicking the closed captioning option at the very bottom of your screen and selecting show subtitles. You can also click view full transcript to view the transcript on the side panel at the meeting. And we wanna thank you to Karen Schmieder who's providing today's CART services. My name is Sonia Childress. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I am wearing a black and gray top I am a black woman with long locks. I'm wearing tortoiseshell glasses. I am sitting against a virtual background of uh, Dutch African print fabric with the name Color Congress above me. And I am joining you from the unceded Tongva land in Southern California, Long Beach, precisely uh, where we are celebrating a Super Bowl win. Um, and I serve as the co-director of Color Congress, along with my colleague, Sahar Driver, who you will meet in a moment. The Color Congress is a new intermediary organization that supports, resources, and connects people of color-led and serving organizations in the documentary film space. Uh, just to situate myself in this conversation and in the room today, I previously worked for two decades as an impact strategist for documentary film, and most recently spent two years in a fellowship supported by the Perspective Fund, and you will meet Danae Peters of the Perspective Fund in a moment, where I engaged in field building initiatives that urged our documentary industry towards greater equity, ethics, and accountability. Another hat that I'm wearing today is as a trustee of the Whitman Institute. And the Whitman Institute is a philanthropic entity that advances social, political, and economic equity by funding dialogue, relationship building, and inclusive leadership. And the Whitman Institute supported a number of journalism, storytelling, and documentary impact initiatives, including Active Voice, which is where a Sahar Driver, Shadi Salehi, and I all got our start in documentary film. Just want to shout out to the Whitman Institute. Whitman is important in this conversation because as a philanthropic entity, Whitman deepened its commitment to practicing trust-based philanthropy over the years and became one of the founding funders to seed the Trust-Based Philanthropy Project, which is co-hosting and leading this conversation today. Um, you know, just as a reflection, you know, uh, for years as a trustee of Whitman, I saw how these practices were um, playing out in various sectors. Um, and I wondered what it might look like for these principles of trust-based philanthropy if they were applied to the field that I worked in, in documentary. And it wasn't until really the cascading catastrophes of 2020 prompted all areas of the documentary sector to reckon internally and externally with questions of power and accountability. And so it makes sense that those of us who are currently engaged in grant making in our sector consider where we fit into these conversations, these difficult conversations, and consider how we can begin to operate in a values-based manner. So in, for today's session, we are hoping to introduce this new grant making practice called Trust-Based Philanthropy. We're going to share some context on where funding and power currently resides in the documentary ecosystem based on recent research. And then we'll hear from grantmakers like yourselves who fund artists, 
film productions and impact campaigns and film organizations. And we'll hear how these grantmakers are evolving their practice towards a trust-based and values-centered framework. We want this conversation today to be a learning space for all of us. And we hope it is the first of many conversations about our role as grant makers and gate openers in the documentary and arts sector. It's great that you already are introducing yourselves and it's wonderful to see so many good friends in the room today. Um, please continue to introduce yourself uh, by letting us know where you're joining us from and who you're representing today. Now I'd like to introduce Shadi Salehi. Shadi is director of the Trust-Based Philanthropy Project. Shadi comes into this conversation with deep knowledge of the documentary field through a decade of service as director of Active Voice and as managing director of distribution and impact at ITVS. Old friend, Shadi, welcome. Thank you, Sonia, and good morning, good day, everyone. So good to be with you. So great to see so many familiar faces um, and names joining us today. Um, my name is Shadi Salehi. I use she, her pronouns. I am an Iranian woman with pale olive skin and long straight-ish brown hair and a side part. Um, I'm in the corner of my office right now with two framed, um, uh, two framed pieces of artwork behind me and a blue vase with purple flowers. Um, it's wonderful to be with you all. I am joining you from um, the la unceded land of the Ohlone people, also known as the San Francisco Bay Area. As Sonia shared, the Trust-Based Philanthropy Project is an initiative to engage, connect, and mobilize funders toward embracing a more power-conscious and equity-centered approach to philanthropy and funder-grantee relationships. This approach, as some of you may know, has been gaining sector-wide uh, attention and recognition uh, as a way to alleviate power imbalances between funders, grant seekers, and communities, really with a vision of advancing and unleashing the potential for impact in our communities. Um, the movement has really been growing over the last couple of years, especially among place-based funders and social issue funders that have recognized the limitations of our traditional funding practices amidst a global pandemic. Um, and this emergent shift is also very much connected to a growing awareness of the deep-seated racial inequities in our society and in our sector as a whole, um, and, and a heightened recognition that philanthropy has a role to play in redistributing power. Before we jump into really talking through today's discussion, we wanted to hear from you first and get a sense of how familiar you are with trust-based philanthropy. So we're going to get a poll up and we'll take a couple seconds to get folks to respond. Um, so how familiar on a scale of one to five are you with the concept of trust-based philanthropy? And we'll just give about 20 or so seconds for that. Great, let's go ahead and share those results. So it looks like we've got a, a great mix. We've got folks who are, who are brand new to the concept um, and a major of kind of a third of folks that are somewhere in the middle. So we're hoping you can enter in based on wherever you what, wherever your entry point is and listen for insights and, and ideas that feel relevant to your grant making. Um, I also want to acknowledge that trust-based philanthropy is not necessarily new. A lot of the practices we're going to be talking about um, may be practices you already employ in your grant making work. So please use the chat as a space to share your insights, your experiences, uh, because it's really about the collective learning that helps us continue to grow and deepen our practice as grant makers. Thank you. So what is trust-based philanthropy? Um, so this is really ultimately it's an approach to giving that addresses the inherent power imbalances that exist between funders, nonprofits, and the communities we serve. So the core of what trust-based philanthropy is all about is about redistributing power, systemically, organizationally, and interpersonally, with an ultimate vision of servicing a healthier and more equitable nonprofit ecosystem. So on a very practical level, this includes multi-year unrestricted funding. On, uh, streamlined applications and reports, and a commitment to building relationships that are based on transparency, dialogue, and mutual learning. That last part is a really important part to emphasize. The traditional approach to philanthropy is rooted in a 
top-down power dynamic in a compliance-oriented culture in our sector that has perpetuated an intense power imbalance between funders and grant seekers. So today's discussion is really gonna be talking about what does this particular approach mean for funders who are funding documentary film and arts? And we recognize that the funders in the room are funding various aspects of this work. So we're gonna be talking about direct support for artists, including support for film productions, as well as individual general support for individual artists. We're also going to be talking about what it looks like to support arts organizations, as well as film-based film impact campaigns. So we're talking about a range of different aspects of arts funding, and we recognize that that's also just a few aspects of the greater ecosystem of arts funding. Um, but really, our focus today will be about the role of this approach in, in documentary film funding in that particular ecosystem. It's also important to name the power dynamics that we have present today in the room. Some of our speakers are grantees of some of the other presenters on our panel. We also have funders of some of our speakers in the room today, as well as people in the room who are prospective grant seekers or past grant seekers of some of the funders presenting. So these power dynamics are always present and part of a trust-based approach is in, in naming that and recognizing that there is that inherent power imbalance and just being intentional about naming it and, and working to alleviate it, especially for those of us that sit in a position of power in making decisions about where resource are resources are allocated. So now that you have a little bit of context on what trust-based philanthropy is, I wanna really kind of ground us in why. And what, what, what we're talking about here is that tr in traditional philanthropy, we have really perpetuated a bit of a values to practice disconnect. And so what we mean by that is that a lot of the values that drive the work behind arts funding, values that of believing in storytelling as a key part of advancing a democracy, values around advancing a thriving culture with you know, diversity and equity, um, you know, values around contributing to the dialogue and community building. A lot of these very positive values are the driving factors that drive a lot of arts and, and film funding. However, our practices don't always reflect the values that we stand behind. So when we say that we stand for diversity, democracy, breaking down barriers, building dialogue, how can we think more intentionally about how our funding practices can actually reflect that? And then when you think about it, these, these, these power dynamics are even more exacerbated when you factor in these systemic inequities that exist in our sector. And you look at a lot of our traditional grant making practices. We have short term project restricted grants, lengthy reporting requirements. Grant decisions are often made by a handful of people that are not necessarily proximate to the communities served or the people whose stories are being shared. And a lot of philanthropic dollars are increasingly difficult to access for emerging artists and artists of color. So we take into account all these power imbalances in our sector and the, the really powerful role that funders play in being gatekeepers and gate openers, as, so, as Sonia has mentioned, to, to open up access to resources. How can we think intentionally about that position of power in the spirit of the values that drive our work? So trust-based philanthropy seeks to alleviate some of those power imbalances. And while the, the, the expression of trust-based philanthropy may not look identical in every organization. What is a constant are the values that drive the work. So this, I, I invite you to consider, do these values show up in the funding that you do? And do your practices reflect these kinds of values? And if not, how can we be more intentional about, about embracing that and, um, and, and aligning our values to our practice? But before we really dig into what that actual practical element looks like, we thought it would be really important to actually share some data that really helps illuminate what is the state of our sector and how do some of these power imbalances show up. So I'm gonna hand it back to Sonia to bring up our next panelists. Thanks. Thank you, Shadi. Um, so, you know, in this moment of, um, you know, field wide and societal reckoning, I think it's, it's often difficult to know um, 
where and how to invest in interventions that make the most impact. And too often solutions to systemic inequities are devised and conceived with limited information in order to fully understand the core problems. And what we're seeing um, as shifts are happening in the field is that advocacy does an incredible job at illustrating a problem, but data can do an important, play an important role in um, providing the solution. So um, we wanted to lift up uh, the work of two respected researchers in our field who can share top level highlights from recent field studies they conducted that offer us some research-based evidence about power and access inequities in the documentary film landscape. And I know that there are some folks in the room who are not just working in documentary field, um, but, but that's gonna be the context for this research. So um, I'm excited to be joined um, by my friends and colleagues and sisters in this work, Katie Borom chatu Katie is the executive director of the Center for Media and Social Impact, an innovation lab and research center at American University that creates, showcases, and studies media designed for social change. She is also an assistant professor at American U in the School of Communications. And since 2016, her team has published an invaluable biannual resource, which is called the State of the Documentary Field, which reveals trends and experiences of contemporary documentary professionals, primarily based in the US. Welcome, Katie. And um, we have Sahar Driver, um, my co-founder and co-director at Color Congress. Another hat that she is wearing today is as a veteran documentary impact strategist, a field builder, and a rock star researcher. Um, in 2020, she authored the Ford Foundation Commission's report, Beyond Inclusion, the Critical Role of People of Color in the US Documentary Ecosystem. Welcome, Sahar. So we'll start with you, Katie. Um, if you could just briefly walk us through, uh, I believe there are six key takeaways from uh, the 2020 state of the field study and, and share with us um, what that data tells us about where power and resources are concentrated at the filmmaker level. Great, thank you, Sonia. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm actually uh, temporarily in New Orleans today. I'm giving a book talk, so I'm on the unceded territory of the Chirimacha people. So hello to anyone in New Orleans. And um, I'll just apologize in advance. I have some complicated logistics. So if you hear jazz, you're welcome. If it sounds noisy, I'm sorry about that, but it is jazz. So um, I am a white woman with brown hair and a black leather jacket sitting against a, a white background. Um, yes, yeah, so thank you very much, uh, Sonia and Shadi for inviting me. It's always such a gift to be able to be in real community with this community that I care about so much. So um, very quickly, I dropped in the chat the link to the, um, the, all of the reports that we've done in the state of the field study. And I just wanna make sure I referenced it because we're trying to get through a lot of material here quickly. So uh, don't worry about taking fast notes because you can always access the reports. So here's what I prepared to, to sort of highlight to you all in the context of this conversation. So first, very briefly, and I'm very grateful to Sonia for giving this background reference um, to the study so that I don't have to be redundant. But we are, we call ourselves engaged scholars, which means that we really work with the fields and the communities of practice that we like to study in order to be sure that the research questions and how we actually conduct the research actually really serves the field. And we're also applying, you know, rigorous social science and communities uh, research uh, protocols to that work. So the state of the fields really came from the community, actually. We were asked to do it in collaboration with the International Documentary Association. And of note to you all, every year that we do it, we do it every other year. And there's you know, a cross section of 45 different US-based documentary organizations. And in, the, in 2020, uh, we added to that global organizations that help to facilitate the respondent um, participation, which is important to ensure diversity and equity uh, among respondents as well. So the findings that I'm gonna give to you today, just a few of the highlights come from the 2020 study, and it's a study of more than 600 documentary professionals that includes uh, people who consider themselves um, directors and producers, but also lots of other hats. And uh, we widen that out to more than 900 
respondents around the world. But for purposes of this conversation, I'm just talking to you about findings from the US um, study, because you'll see a giant 200 page study in that link. Um, and also, this is important to mention, there are many different demographic characteristics by which we could analyze this massive uh, survey data. But because of the known inequities that really deal with uh, race and gender in this field, we do the larger and also numerically and statistically, this is uh, the best way to handle this data. We show all of the findings according to all respondents, but also do separate breakdowns along gender and racial lines, just so you all know. And just for purposes of this conversation, we divided uh, BIPOC and white and you can read the full methodology because I know people always want to ask um, how we do that. And there's lots of extensive methodology that, that tells you that in the report. And then also for purposes of gender, we look at uh, male and female identifying and non-binary. The non-binary number is very small. So we generally show these results uh, in terms of male and female. Okay, so now that you all are ready, let me tell you a few things that are directly relevant to the conversation that's being hosted today. So um, from the report, we learned in 2020, and also this is fairly consistent since 2016, since we've done this study, that BIPOC and women identifying filmmakers are the most um, economically challenged in terms of all aspects of finances, film income, revenue, access to bigger money that streaming networks can offer. So overall, um, BIPOC documentary professionals and primary makers, directors and producers, are generally, as we wrote, having a wholly different experience in the documentary industry. So just to give you a little bit more specificity on this, this is really important. BIPOC filmmakers receive the most and rely the most heavily on philanthropic organizations and public TV for their funding, for their revenue, and for their distribution. This is a really outsized uh, relationship there. So to give you a number to that, 41% of BIPOC filmmakers receive their main source of funding from grants, 41%, compared to 27% of filmmakers. So what that really means uh, and why that statistic matters is that what we know is that white filmmakers are receiving a much more diversified stream of funding to make documentaries, both from commissioned work and other sources um, than BIPOC filmmakers, which generally makes um, those who are reliant on philanthropic support uh, a little bit more vulnerable in lots of different ways. So that's just some context setting for you all. Um, also thus far, BIPOC filmmakers are dramatically less likely to be funding by streaming networks to make uh, their work. So that's uh, obviously incredibly important since that is the financial growth uh, in the field. A couple of other statistics for you all, and I am watching the time, so yeah, don't worry. Um, BIPOC filmmakers are much less likely than white filmmakers to garner um, funding, documentary revenue, and personal income from streaming networks. And this is important, even though this is what people are most excited about. Um, okay, so when it comes to just documentary revenue from most recent film is how we ask the question. Um, there's some big differences here, and I'm only reporting on the areas where we saw really big differences along uh, racial and gender lines. So when we ask people, how much revenue did you receive from your most recent film? Um, we find that 55% of BIPOC filmmakers said their film did not make any revenue at all compared to 35% of white filmmakers. So I just wanna tell you statistically, that's a very, very big difference. And um, uh, moving down my list here, when we asked about salary from most recent documentary, um, uh, 41%, oh, I mentioned this to you all, 41% of documentary filmmakers who identify as BIPOC uh, said that they did not receive any salary at all from their most recent documentary compared to 36%. So that's a smaller difference, but still a, st a statistically meaning meaningful one. So those are just a few different um, pieces there. And I, you know, I, I like to put that into context because on the one hand, it's all how you read this data, right? So on the one hand, we could say, and this is true, I am a philanthropically supported person too, and my organization is 100% supported by foundations. So on the one hand, how grateful for philanthropies for supporting this work. On the other hand, it is incredibly uh, vulnerable for an entire subset of a, of a profession to rely very heavily on one source of income. So that's um, uh, revenue, funding, income, all of it. 
I'll just add in here in my remaining, I think one minute, um, the, a, a few gender pieces too. I know this is, we are really focused heavily on power imbalances along lines of race and ethnicity. I fully understand that. But as a researcher, I always, and not but, and as a researcher, I always wanna be responsible in telling you that that's not where the only inequity lies pretty consistently. Um, gender continues to be um, pretty persistent. So just a few data points here to sort of round uh, my talk out here. So when we ask film uh, directors and producers, male identifying and women uh, identifying, again, non-binary, too small to um, analyze in the exact same way. So 42% of women filmmakers said that their film did not make any revenue at all, their most recent film, compared to 35% of men. So that's actually quite a big difference. Um, and uh, I, I think putting this all together, this is a, a piece that I want to say to kind of pull this together. When we think about what many of us in this documentary community, and I love that we always call ourselves that, what many of us care about it, with this um, set of genres in the first place in nonfiction is its incredible persuasive power uh, for activism, right? So even though it exists in a capitalist media network, we think of documentaries as able to show uh, lives that are not often portrayed elsewhere, et cetera, et cetera. So it's important for you all to also know that when it comes to the people who are actually doing the work in that way, addressing social issues and public affairs issues, seven in 10, that's 72%, it's a very big number of BIPOC documentary film filmmakers last film addressed social issues and public affairs compared to 57% of white filmmakers. And similarly, 67% of women documentary uh, filmmakers um, said their last film dealt with social issues compared to 49% of men. So it's important to always remember who's actually doing the work that I think that we care about most when it comes to the intersection of social justice and activism and social change and progress that the very filmmakers who seem to be the most economically vulnerable are the ones doing the lion's share of the work. Um, so I'll stop there. Thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Katie, and for the jazz uh, in the background. Um, you know, so what, what you're really vis visibilizing are, are these structural barriers to sustainability for filmmakers of color and women uh, identified filmmakers um, and also a pre predilection to covering and, and using that this art form to address uh, social issues. So that's really helpful data. I wanna go to you now, Sahar, if you could uh, briefly walk us through the landscape scan that you conducted for the Beyond Inclusion Report and tell us how what your research revealed about the challenges that face organizations and maybe they mirror some of the data that Katie just showed um, and how some of these organizations are responding to these structural barriers. Thanks, Sonia. Thanks, Katie, for all of that context as well. Um, Sahara Driver, my pronouns are she, her, uh, and I'm uh, talking to you from Muwekma and Olone territory, uh, unseated in Oakland. Um, and I have long, I'm an Iranian American woman with uh, long curly brown hair and a blue sweater and um, uh, light, um, light glasses on and a magenta background. Um, my the the Ford report, um, the Ford commissioned uh, research that I conducted um, in 2019 um, was essentially a landscape scan that took a pretty broad and sweet, sweeping look at almost 200 organizations out there uh, working in the documentary field that are led by or serving people of color, either as a function of their core work or as a contained um, or, or limited program or offering. Um, and our aim was to understand who's out there serving documentary filmmakers of co color, um, what are they doing and what is needed to help them do their work. Um, and that research involved formal interviews, informal conversations with stakeholders across the field, a ton of online research, then after the report's release, I did a bit more research to um, dig into uh, a number of other questions, including an online survey uh, to understand what these organizations need. Um, uh, it also involved 
more follow-up interviews after that and more informal conversations, even roundtable discussions, a number of them iteratively, iteratively gathering feedback and understanding um, as we build uh, and design uh, the Color Congress intervention. Um, and uh, the research that went into the report um, identified a ton of good programs that serve people of color at historically white institutions, but there's a smaller subset of about 90 organizations that are led by people of color who are uniquely positioned to understand the challenges that filmmakers and leaders of color in the field face that are led by people, many filmmakers themselves, who saw a need and created solutions from that place of understanding, uh, who created organizations that have sustained those commitments over time, some for decades, literally, and they have remained unswayed um, by the changing social and political climate um, uh, and other kinds of transitions that organizations can be, other or types of organizations can be more vulnerable to. And that's because um, the commitment to building the storytelling and leadership of people of color in documentary is foundational to who they are and what they do. Um, well over half of the organizations um, in that research in the uh, for the report provided some form of artist support much of it was place based about 22% of the entities that provide that support are film festivals, um, many of which are regionally based um, and the ecosystem of POC led organizations. Um, uh, that help to ensure that are uh, of organizations that are helping to ensure that once a film by a person of color is completed, it will reach um, audiences. That's part of what they do. It's significant that 85 percent of the org of the organizations that in that broader 200 organizational scan that play some role in distribution, getting stories by people of color uh, filmmakers out to audiences were organizations led by a POC leader. Um, and yet what the research shows is that uh, despite playing a really critical and enduring role in strengthening and centering um, storytelling by filmmakers of color about people of color and for audiences of color, um, these organizations are perpetually overlooked, underappreciated and under-resourced. Similar, um, similar story. Um, the survey that I conducted after the report's release um, was of more than a quarter of this uh, POC documentary ecosystem. And we wanted to understand what kind of support would be useful to them aside from funding. And one of the top things that people said that they would like is support for financial sustainability. Uh, 72 people, 72 percent of the people who responded to that survey said that. Um, so it's a top priority. Another thing that they said, um, another top priority was opportunities for networking and collaboration. And uh, 72 percent uh, also said that. Um, we looked through the Foundation Maps Canada database uh, for any of uh, the 90 POC led and serving organizations in our landscape scan that may have received funding between 2016 and 2020 to kind of really dig in to understand what the funding scarcity, uh, what it looks like. And we found that only nine out of those 90 received funding in that period. And of these uh, nine, only two received grants totaling more than 500,000 over the period. Um, based on this research, we are estimating um, somewhere between one to 5% of funding related to documentary is going to majority POC led and serving organizations. Now that's, you know, not definitive. Um, we're drawing on the best tools that we have, one of the best tools that we have, um, but they are the numbers are consistent with what we're seeing in other sectors where white led organizations receive dramatically more funding than POC led organizations. Um, and as a result, um, those organizations that have bigger aspirations are forced to remain small. Um, in fact, 40% of the survey respondents um, told us their organizations have budgets under $100,000, 40%. If that's reflective of the field, that's concerning. Um, and while some want to remain small and discreet, we know that even the smaller organizations have a hard time staying afloat. Um, in interviews and conversations over the last couple of years, all kinds of themes have repeatedly come up about the causes of this funding gap and related issues, um, including a lack of access to national funding because uh, due to the uh, people who were talking with do their work being local. This is uh, especially challenging for some who say they don't have access to local funders either because of regional or local grant makers or funding ecosystems are scarce where they are. 
Um, one organization has uh, had trouble getting any funding at all due to um, being based in Puerto Rico, where uh, the country's uh, or Puerto Rico's technical status, I should say, as a commonwealth of the US has kept it from being eligible from receiving both international uh, or uh, domestic funding. Um, we heard repeatedly how tired people are uh, from all that they have to do to raise funds to prove their worth. Uh, often through success metrics, they see as problematic or missing the point or sometimes uh, having to do all the work on their own. Uh, many of the heads of these organizations were filmmakers themselves who began addressing um, a need without any leadership or management training, and that adds to their exhaustion. Um, but also, they've talked about the pressure they feel to scale um, or to centralize their entities or formalize them into 501c3s. Uh, for those organizations that are operating outside of the major media centers, they may not have the benefit of networking or relationship building opportunities where they can strengthen industry relationships and therefore their organizations through them. Uh, many have expressed how the value of their work goes unrecognized and unseen by the broader industry that doesn't always recognize their work as a core component of a filmmaker's career trajectory, or that they have been educating or leading conversations that are reshaping the field in ways that strengthen it. Um, and uh, But they, they're also doing that work that's strengthening the field without any recognition of the emotional toll and the uh, labor it entails, often uncompensated. Um, and yet, despite all of these challenge, challenges, uh, this ecosystem of organizations do this work based on their commitments to filmmakers, leaders, and audiences of color. And we're happy to talk more about um, what Color Congress is doing to support these organizations at any point, but that's what the research we've been doing has shown. Thank you both so much for sharing this data. We wanted to level set a bit before um, we go into the rest of the conversation. It's it's incredibly important that we all hear this data at the same time we consider the structural, uh, the gendered and racialized and, uh, and many other barriers um, that face artists and organizations. And we can really, as we hear this data, really uh, appreciate the critical role that philanthropic interventions have on the field. And as we make shifts in who is doing the grant making and where we are directing our dollars. Today, we're really focusing on the shifts in how we direct those dollars. So I'm gonna pass it back over um, to Sahar to walk us through the principles of trust-based philanthropy. Thank you both. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you, Katie and Sahar for that wonderful grounding in data. Um, I think it's really important for us to take in what we just heard because trust-based philanthropy is not about finding leaders that you like and want to trust. <laughs> it's about doing your homework about the landscape within which we're funding and being intentional and thoughtful about using our role as funders to put resources where they're most needed and to bring that support where it's most needed. So that data, that context, that knowledge is such a key part of thinking about how we apply these values of advancing democracy, building dialogue, uh, bridging divides, all these things require us to be aware of the context within which we are operating. Um, so I really wanna thank Sahar and Katie again for just that grounding. But now we wanna talk about, okay, well now we have some of this information, how does this actually look in grant making practice? How can we be intentional as funders in taking in that information and applying it to our practice. So I wanna just reground us in the values of a trust-based approach. And this first piece of working for systemic equity, I hope is a little bit clearer why that's such a key part of a, of a trust-based approach. It's in kind of, re, it's redistributing the power. And we really got a sense of the inequities in power, access, distribution, funding access, um, but also mental health, wellness, sustainability. There's a lot of inequities that exist in our overall nonprofit sector as a whole, and we've seen it really highlighted in the art and film world. So what does it look like to model values of systemic equity, redistributing power, centering relationships, partnering in a spirit of service, being accountable, embracing learning? What does that look like in a trust-based context? There are six key practices that 
when practiced together can contribute to uh, building more genuine long-term trust-based relationships and also um, can help alleviate a lot of these power imbalances that we're talking about. First and foremost, giving multi-year unrestricted funding. Sahar made the case for that in some of the data that she provided. And for many of the funders who have embraced this, you know, nonprofits have been talking for decades about the need for multi-year flexible investment to support their work, which is long-term and unpredictable. In the last several years have really illuminated for all of us how unpredictable of a world we live in. Trust-based philanthropy is about doing the homework. We've already talked a little bit about doing the homework on the landscape within which we operate. How can we be thoughtful and intentional uh, and educated on the, uh, the landscape within which we're funding? It's about simplifying and streamlining paperwork, recognizing that the time of nonprofits and artists is valuable. If we want them to make an impact, we want them to focus on their work, then how can we reduce some of the transactional barriers that get in the way of them being able to do that work? And then the final three practices really embody this ethos of what it means to show up in a trust-based way, to be intentional and aware of the power that we hold as funders, and really working intentionally to build a genuine relationship and check our own biases in that kind of relationship building. So it's about being transparent and responsive in our relationships. It's about soliciting and acting on feedback. So getting feedback from grantee partners to inform how we do our grant making and to act on that. And then offering support beyond the check, like Sahar underscored so beautifully, there's more, there's a need for more than just dollars alone. And as funders, we have a lot that we can bring to the table beyond just the financial support. So how can we bring that to the table as a, yet another offering if we truly wanna support our partners? So I am delighted to bring up our panel today to actually talk about what, does, what do these practices look like? Because they look a little different with different organizations. We have four funders here today representing different types of funding in different types of areas. So we encourage you to listen to what feels relevant to your work. Um, and please also share any reflections. We are covering a lot of ground today. <clears throat> so we will not be able to do a dedicated Q&A portion. We did weave in some of the questions that people offered us upon registration into our discussion today. Um, if you have a burning question, please put it in the chat and we'll do our best to bring it in if it feels relevant. Uh, but we'll also have a survey where you can pose any additional questions if we want to, if you're interested in exploring an ongoing conversation after today. So thank you for your patience as we try to cover a lot of ground. Um, so I would love to just introduce our panelists. Um, and in, in the interest of time, I'm just going to kind of call upon you to introduce yourselves um, and please share a little bit about your grant making organization and where, where you are in this kind of trust-based philanthropy journey and context. Um, and I'll, we'll start with you, Sonia Childress of Color Congress, and then we'll, we'll go on with the rest. Sure, I'll just say briefly, you know, Color Congress is a new intermediary um, field building organization. We launched last month. Uh, Color Congress launched as an intervention based directly on the research that Sahar conducted for the Ford Foundation that visibilized the unique needs of organizations that are led by and serve filmmakers of color in the documentary ecosystem. So we have three main interventions. We are a grant making entity that will offer unrestricted two year grants um, to su uh, supplemental grants to organizations that are led by and serve uh, folks of color in the doc sector. Um, we are uh, offering a second grant um, that supports uh, capacity building, sustainability needs, and also field, field building interventions, bold ideas that come from this ecosystem of 90 or so POC led and serving organizations. And the third is that we are creating a Congress, a representative body where all of these organizations, whether they're festivals or artist serving entities or collectives can come together connect, um, build uh, relationships and build power ultimately for the benefit of the documentary sector and for the benefit of our greater society. So that's the new uh, initiative. Thank you, Sonia. Next, I'd like to introduce Danae Peters of Perspective Fund. Danae, please introduce yourself. 
Hello, I'm Danae Peters. I use she, her pronouns. I am currently in Brooklyn on Lenape land. I am a black woman with curly hair and gold glasses, and I'm wearing purple lipstick and a sweatshirt, a white sweatshirt with shoulder pads. Behind me is a bookcase and a cement wall. I am a program officer at Perspective Fund, and we currently offer two categories of grants. Both are aimed at strengthening connections between the documentary sector and the broader social justice ecosystem. We aim to develop our strategies and our approaches around a thoughtful and trust-based approach to relationships with our grantees and partners in the field. So through our film granting portfolio, which offers support for films at any stage of production and impact campaigns, we are looking for filmmakers and film teams that can show a number of things. Uh, we're hoping that they are showing an intentional and thoughtful approach to the way they identify who their key audiences are for their impact strategies. And we expect that our um, that their editorial and production designs would reflect that. We are looking for those who are promoting decision-making power for members of directly affected communities. We're hoping that they're incorporating expertise from knowledgeable and similarly accountable issue area stakeholders, which in some cases includes film participants themselves and that they're using this support for the purposes of developing a thoughtful strategy and resources that are in line with the needs and goals of the associated movement. And we're looking for those who can demonstrate meaningful consideration of how their work can present an opportunity for shared learning and experimentation in the way the film makes its way into the world. And through our infrastructure portfolio, which I oversee, we fund organizations and initiatives that we think are critical to the ecosystem that this type of doc content is born from. Those are the organizations and the leaders who are working to build, sustain, and evolve the knowledge base, the infrastructure, and the terms of engagement for members of our field. So we're looking to amplify aspects of our ecosystem that increase access and capacity across the documentary storytelling pipeline, especially for historically excluded creators, strategists, and audiences. We are hoping to remove longstanding barriers to long-term sustainability for organizations and creators and to foster more models for field-led organizing and collaboration, as well as redistribution of power. And lastly, to contribute to systemic shifts that are necessary for our field to amplify more spaces and resources for experimentation in impact tools, tactics, and philosophies. Amazing. Thank you, Danae. I think you're already hearing some examples of how these values can show up in grant making strategy. Um, next, um, on to Eleanor Savage of the Jerome Foundation. Eleanor, please introduce yourself. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. I'm Eleanor Savage. I'm the program director at Jerome Foundation. Uh, I am a uh, white, uh, slightly past middle aged. Uh, <laughs> um, of Scots Irish descent. I'm uh, uh, short cropped hair, uh, glasses, um, a dark shirt and, and suit coat. And behind me is uh, bookshelves and plants uh, against a yellow wall. Um, Jerome Foundation is based in Minnesota, uh, the unceded territory of the D Dakota peoples and uh, current home to Dakota and Anishinaabe peoples. Uh, Jerome Foundation has been around for 58 years. Our focus is uh, supporting early career artists. Uh, we are geographically focused on uh, artists based in Minnesota uh, or New York City, the five boroughs of New York City. We fund both individual artists as well as arts organizations that support early career artists. Uh, we, in, in terms of uh, film, we, we have a, a New York City uh, film video and digital production program. We also have a Minnesota uh, film video digital production program and um, an artist development program for filmmakers, early career filmmakers. Uh, we also have a two-year fellowship program that we fund that funds across all uh, fields, including uh, film and video and uh, our arts organization programs. Thank you, Eleanor. And we're gonna hear a little bit more about, um, about those programs shortly. Um, last but not least, Molly Murphy of Working Films, kind of wearing two hats, 
um, as both kind of representing a, a leader of a nonprofit arts organization, but also a regranter. Um, please introduce yourself, Molly. Thanks, Shadi. Hi, everyone. I am Molly Murphy. My pronouns are she, her. I am uh, on the land of the Seminole in Miami today on the brink of a much needed vacation, but I uh, live on the coast of North Carolina, which is the territory of the Cape Fear in Wilmington, North Carolina. Uh, I'm a white woman. I'm from the US South. I have long dark brown hair um, with some blonde tips at the end. I'm wearing a white tank top and some green and gold leaf shaped earrings. I have a tattoo up my arm um, of a flower and my background is grayish, brownish and I wish it looked more like the Color Congress one. Um, but up above me, it says working films story leads to action. That's our tagline. Um, I'm the director of partnerships and innovation at Working Films, and I've been with the organization 21 years. <laughs> so I've served in a lot of different roles, including um, being the co-executive director. Um, and what Working Films does is leverage the power of documentary film to advance social and environmental justice. And at the same time, we are working to advance equity, accountability, anti-racism, and care um, in documentary filmmaking practices and in the field. We have two intermediary funds that began in 2018, and they support the completion of short documentary films, which we also utilize in our organizing campaigns. And then we also have a fund that supports the impact campaigns of um, underrepresented filmmakers. And these uh, pass-through funds that we provide are supported by the Fledgling Fund, the Perspective Fund, and the MacArthur Foundation. Thank you. We have a, a fabulous panel and I'm really excited to get right into it. Um, so we're gonna talk through the six practices of trust-based philanthropy and what does it look like to do it this way? So first and foremost, multi-year unrestricted funding, or my God, as Vule likes to refer to it. This has been something that nonprofit leaders have been talking about the need for for a long, long time. Um, it's, an, it's an automatic way to signal trust. A multi, an, an unrestricted investment automatically signals trust and can be an opportunity to build a relationship over time. Um, however, multi-year unrestricted funding is pretty uncommon in our sector. Uh, so I wanna start with you, Eleanor. You, you brought up the two-year fellowships that you provide for, multi, for emerging artists. Can you share a little bit more about that approach and is it just fully unrestricted support? Uh, yeah, if I'm honest, it's, it's not, we, I would say it's flexible support um, as opposed to unrestricted because we, we still ask artists to use the funds in support of their creative work. Um, and this can be actively creating work. It can be doing um, artist uh, development or professional development, um, but it has to tie specifically to their creative lives. And how do you make the decision on who to fund? And do you have to ever manage any questions from your board or otherwise about it being too risky of an investment to invest in early career artists? Mm -hmm. We. We fully use panel process for all of our grant making. Um, and the, on our panels, we have artists and arts leaders uh, who are evaluating the applications. And so um, one of our values around our grant making is diversity. So we wanna reflect that in not only who receives the funds, but who's making the decisions about those funds. Um, our last round of the fellowship program, 86% of the artists identified as Black, Latinx, Asian, Native American, Middle Eastern, and multiracial. Uh, and 78% of the panelists uh, identified in that way. So uh, we, we really want to haul that. In terms of risk, I'm very lucky. I work for a foundation where risk is one of our core values. Um, you know, artists are, are taking risks. They're also at risk. Uh, and uh, we see our, uh, it's our job uh, to be in service to the artist and to be um, 
to recognize them as the stewards of their work. There's so much there that I want to unpack, but I know there's a really specific question that often comes up when supporting individual artists. And there's um, questions or concerns about how do you even give, a, you know, is it possible to fund an individual? Like, what is that? How do you structure that kind of grant agreement? Yes, we have a, as a private foundation, we have a, an IRS um, uh, approval uh, to fund individual artists. Uh, I know that that is a formal application process, but I uh, came into the foundation with that already in place. Jerome has been funding individual artists uh, for as long as uh, I think it has been in operation. And uh, so, you know, there is a, that logistical uh, legal piece that you need to do. Uh, but other than that, it is, is very similar to funding an organization, except it's a, a direct relationship with artists. Uh, I think one of the things that's really critical, uh, especially uh, for us working with early career artists, is to provide uh, beyond the grant, provide support around the um, financial logistics of managing grant funds and dealing with the tax implications and those kind of things. Uh, so um, we go into it very aware of what some of the challenges might be uh, for artists based on what we have heard from artists. Mm, that's awesome. And I think it also underscores the importance and the value of having artists on your board that can also kind of understand what it, the experience is like for artists and also inform the process. Um, amazing. Thank you, Eleanor. Um, Danae, um, moving on to you, you've you've described, um, you know, Perspective offers grants in a number of areas. Um, what is your approach to multi-year unrestricted funding? Are you providing it? Is that kind of across the board? How do you think about that and structure that? We are providing it, um, and I'm speaking specifically about our infrastructure portfolio. We, in 2021, for example, of the grants that moved through our infrastructure portfolio, about 50% were gen ops unrestricted. About 70% of those were multi-year. And over the past couple of years, we've been working on moving uh, a number of our grantees who were receiving gen ops support from one year support to multi-year. In most cases, it's two years. We're working on uh, three years in others. We did this by looking at existing relationships where we already had trust built, um, as well as by having honest and open conversations with newer organizations about what they needed in order to stay afloat or to pursue something new. So for us, it took being a little bit more bold in offering uh, this type of support. In cases where we were offering support for the first time as well, when it was very clear that we were very well aligned with the work that we hope to see in the field. Um, we've also taken more steps recently than we have in previous years. Um, and this is based on a lot of what uh, Sahar shared were the reflections of leaders that multi-year unrestricted support, support is exactly what they need in order to feel like sustainability in all its forms is achievable. Mm. And that's such a, a, an example of what it means to be a responsive funder, really kind of listening to the needs of the field. You know, a concern or a question that sometimes comes up when talking about unrestricted funding is kind of this question of, well, how do you know what is going on with the grant if it's not tied to a specific project? Like, how do you really know things are going on? How do you stay connected to the work that your grantee partners are doing in this kind of unrestricted context? Um, there are a lot of different ways. And I think um, we try to make sure that we're putting forth as much effort as possible in order to understand our grantees work. So sometimes that looks like participating in their programming where it's appropriate and asking questions. Um, it means that we aren't relying solely on formal written reporting. In the past couple of years, we have offered the opportunity for those who want it to have verbal reporting with us or to share reports that they've prepped for other funders. And then we're asking specific questions where those would be more meaningful than a standardized question might be. Um, 
This year, we're also going to begin implementing open door sessions, and this is something that's in progress. It's going to be guided by the questions that our grantees want to be asked and the conversations that they want to have with us. So that would be unlike most formal reporting conversations. It's still something that's in progress, but it was born out of another method that we have had recently for staying in tune, in tune with our grantees, which is a convening series mm -hmm. uh, for those in our infrastructure portfolio which we crafted as a time to offer a connection amongst the cohort, but also to develop a more frequent two-way channel of communication between them and us as funders. And I can certainly share more of that later in the chat. I love it. And it really, what you're highlighting, Danae, is that a lot of these trust-based practices are interconnected to other ones, right? So when you're giving an, when you're investing multi-year unrestricted grants, and you're simplifying some of the paperwork processes, it frees up space for relationship building. And that's really the core of what we're talking about here. It's like, this is actually about stripping down some of those transactional elements that get in the way of relationship to actually being able to have real, real partnership and, and a more um, bigger picture understanding of what's going on and actually more transparency uh, from grantee partners as well, when you kind of are, are creating those, those contexts. So Sonia, I want to come to you next because you mentioned that the Color Congress has launched with a two-year unrestricted grants as kind of the, the default offering. Um, what informed that decision and, um, and how did you have to make an argument to your founding funders for taking that approach? Well, luckily, Danae is one of our founding funders. <laughs> <laughs> And it helps. It helps to have a fellow uh, impact producer um, in a in a grant making role because there's a there's an inherent ethos there around power sharing and relationship building that comes with the practice of impact production. Where Danae came into this work as well. Um, but you know, in all seriousness, our three founding funders for our new initiative are the Ford Foundation, the MacArthur Foundation, and Perspective Fund. And I think our program officers all really share a similar ethos. Um, and certainly they um, also were responding to the Ford Commission report that Sahar presented that visibilized the needs of uh, vulnerable uh, POC led and serving documentary um, organizations and, and that those needs were not solely financial but they were largely financial. Um, and, you know, because you know, Color Congress is a data-driven intervention. You know, we we had all the information we needed to understand the best place we could intervene, and so you know, it was really clear through that uh, research that there was um, there needed we needed to advance a, a historic investment to create to correct historic disinvestment of this these POC led and serving organizations, and you can't you know, make general, 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 generational investments in organizations if you're offering project-based support. You have to offer unrestricted grant support to start to level the playing field for organizations that have been chronically underfunded and under-recognized in our field. So, um, and, but given that, we still could have made a decision to prioritize organizations that are already on their way that have national funding and could really use, you know, some more wind beneath their sails. We're actually prioritizing the opposite um, within our ecosystem of 90 or so organizations. Um, you know, we are providing uh, unrestricted grants to the most vulnerable in this ecosystem. That is meaning organizations that are either too small, too local, too specific, too new, or too informal to secure national funding, yet vital to the filmmakers who they serve. And, and, and vital to the audiences of color who are served by those filmmakers in those films. So we're, we're really trying to scaffold and support um, the, the most vulnerable and most vital entities within our ecosystem with the greatest expression of trust that we can offer, which is unrestricted grants. Mm, that's such a beautiful expression mm -hmm. of having done your homework and building a responsive grant making strategy uh, and doing the homework there, that's that's why it's one of the core principles of a trust-based approach. So it's part of partially understanding the landscape within which we're funding, 
uh, but also doing our homework as funders to get to know prospective grantees who might not even know about the resources that are available. And that's such a key part because when we think back to the access data that Katie and Sahar shared, there, you know, we've built up these kind of like ivory towers of philanthropy that are really hard for people to even access or know that they're there. So we need to, as funders, take on the onus of doing that homework and identifying prospective grantees. Um, and so I want to come to you, Molly. Uh, you know, at Working Films, you've taken on an intentional approach, working side by side with movement leaders uh, to identify prospective grantees, both for the short film fund and the impact campaign fund. How, can you share more about that approach and how do you in particular factor in the notion of accountability to communities when you're doing that homework? Yes. Um... And I'll just preface it, and I'm going to speak low. Um, I'm in an echoey co-working space. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to sleep, speak low and slow. But, you know, just as Katie and Sahar outlined in their research, the documentary sector is a space that has contributed to the unequal distribution of resources and overwhelmingly favored white established career filmmakers and often independently wealthy filmmakers. And we saw that because the first 13 years of working films, we did filmmaker services and impact campaign de design and support um, and implementation. And those who could afford to work with us were just that overwhelmingly um, white established, often independently wealthy, um, often had funders already in place. And so we explicitly created the impact kickstart program to offer those services free of charge where we saw this glaring gap. Um, so that's just kind of some context about how that program began and also what we prioritize and support for the short film fund. Um, but before we became a funder and even still uh, much of our work is film driven organizing campaigns. It involves active relationships with community and grassroots organizations. And we work just as hard to amplify the funding opportunities with those partners, which really over the last two decades are like thousands of organizations and coalitions and networks, because we know that um, they're able to tap into storytelling that maybe the more insular documentary establishment um, may not reach. And so we're very intentional of um, having our calls for media um, include both the documentary industry, but also our grassroots and advocacy partners. Last year, um, and really this took a lot of um, looking inward at our story shift program and our work with the documentary accountability working group and wanting to embody the same values in our own practices. So with the Docs in Action Film Fund for the first time um, and really, you know, rooted in our core belief that, you know, grassroots leaders directly impacted people, they should have the power to determine what stories are told um, and what films are funded to serve their movements um, and to, you know, tell the stories that are ultimately uh, reflective of their lived experience. So we ceded final decision-making power. Um, we don't serve on the grant panel for the short film funds. Um, and they instead were selected by our partners, which we do themed funds. Every two years we have a theme. And um, the last fund was on uh, prison and policing abolition. So partners at the Center for Political Education, Critical Resistance, uh, MPD 150 and Survived and Punished um, were the decision makers of how um, the grants were made. And we facilitated that process. You know, we set up the submittable um, and we go through a pre, you know, process with them to listen, what are the narratives um, both that can contribute to your work and advancing it? What are, um, what are messages and narratives that are getting in your way so that we can develop a really clear um, call for media that serves their needs? Um, and then facilitate a process by which they um, can review the films and make the decision. We do, you know, some of the shortlisting, make sure films aren't on totally different topics and hold the weight of the administrative process. But for us, that's been an important um, seeding of power, which especially is a historically white-led organization. Um, 
and with an intention of uprooting white supremacy and um, detrimental practices and funding and and in other ways, we just um, think is an important evolution. And the same for the Impact Kickstart Fund, which is um, focused on impact campaigns. Also, the panelists are reflective of whom the award is um, available to. So the definition of underrepresented filmmakers, which we define, um, I'll send the link because it includes uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color, non-binary people, people with disabilities, um, so I'm not going to say the whole list, but on the accountability front, um, what began to appear in applications, which is great, is asking filmmakers, what is your personal connection to the issues in this film? Um, and that's a great starting place. Um, I think another thing that the Documentary Accountability Working Group has helped to illuminate is also what's the motivation? Um, why are you actually wanting to tell this, um, you know, to whatever the motivation is. So this question of connection and motivation. We also asked explicitly, how have you demonstrated accountability to the communities and the individual stories that you're telling? And we asked, how do the people in your film consent and endorse um, the film and support your ideas and your plans for impact. And we give the option to uh, include, it's not required to include letters of support, but you can include letters of support and endorsement. But this question of consent and endorsement, I think goes a little bit further than the um, authorship um, or personal connection. So that's, those are some of the ways that we've mm. evolved. Thank you for those great examples of really what it looks like to share and redistribute power as uh, as uh, someone who's in charge of like making decisions about grants. Um, and this accountability piece I really want to lift up because a question that often comes up um, from funders that want to explore trust-based philanthropy is like, well, how can I find the grantees that I can trust? And I think one of the key elements that, that we're hearing in what Molly is describing and others as well is that really it's part of building a relationship and getting a sense, especially if you're funding an artist, do they have a sense of accountability to the community whose story they're sharing? And how is that showing up and how are they being intentional about that? So it's it's not a matter of finding the, the, the grantees you can trust. It's actually about spending time having a discussion and a dialogue to really understand the vision and the values alignment. That's a core part of this work. Um, so of course it is important to have some of those questions up front. However, another part of trust-based philanthropy is simplifying and streamlining paperwork. And some of you, actually many of you, have really embraced that on the reporting end and really thinking differently about reporting. And Danae, you've already talked about accepting proposals written for other funders. So we have some expressions of this simplified paperwork happening here. Um, Eleanor, I want to turn to you because you, you've mentioned that you take a very streamlined approach with the Fellowship for Early Career Artists. Um, is there a final report and how do you know how do you get a sense of the impact that came as a result of your support? Like, what? How do you assess that if you have streamlined paperwork processes? Yeah, uh, we we do have a a report, and the report is the intention of that is twofold. One is to just hear from the artist what their experience was, what they uh, it's a narrative of what they did uh, during the two year fellowship. We also ask for feedback about what we did, uh, the Jerome Foundation, and how uh, we could do better if there's anything that could improve the experience for the artist. So it's a feedback loop. Um, and we feel like that is the critical information uh, for being responsive uh, to artists and to, co to continue to grow um, and, and create accessibility. Um, so we don't have any, uh, you know, impact metrics that we're looking for. Uh, we're mostly just trying to understand from the artist what their experience was. Danae, uh, onto you. You you also mentioned you take a pretty streamlined approach. How do you think about impact, and how do you document and capture that with your funded organizations? I'd say it's an ongoing process as someone I think shared in the chat when we're trying to develop practices that are based on trust-based philanthropy practices. It's a long journey. So um, we've spent a lot of time as a team 
redefining what impact looks like for us and redesigning the way that we consider film projects or organizations around the filmmakers or organizations being able to show an awareness of the audience that they're serving and being honest and clear about what their work or what their project can do and is appropriate to do. And we wanna see that that's informed by partners, by stakeholders, by movement leaders. And for us, we are allowing the organization or the film team to define what impact looks like to them. And that's the metric that we hold the uh, process and success of a project up to, as opposed to an impact metric that is explicitly st stated by us and is applied to any number of projects, issue areas, um, or organizations. Mm, that's such an important kind of reframe because it allows us to see impact that we would not have considered. Um, you know, Eleanor, you had shared a story and I would love to invite you to share the story about how, how as funders, we have to check our biases about what we think impact is when it comes to art. And you had shared the story about, you know, we need to challenge our assumptions that Sundance is the end goal for all filmmakers. Can you speak to that, please? Yeah, we have um, filmmakers who are working from, you know, within a particular community. Um, uh, and, you know, I've been in conversation with um, a Hmong filmmaker uh, based here in Minnesota, uh, also uh, Native filmmakers who their intention isn't their goals aren't to go get to Sundance. Their goals are actually to tell a story uh, that within their own community to create visibility, to create um, you know connection within their own communities and the power of that. Uh, so there's not just one you know one path uh, that artists are interested in, and you know artists are problem solvers and. Uh, I think we need to like hear from artists uh, what they're doing, what what they define as success, not what we define as success. Hmm. And it really, to me, it's kind of liberating, right? Like when you take that more expansive understanding, then you <laughs> open up your eyes to all these other impacts that you had not considered. And I think it really underscores this it's really a learning mindset that you bring in a trust-based approach it's open to learning open to evolving understanding and recognizing that as funders we don't have all the answers we haven't figured it all out and that we need to continue to evolve and refine um it's also yeah. kind of, um, please go ahead oh i was just going to say i think you know you'd mentioned uh how can i find funders saying how can i find artists that i can trust and i think you have to start by saying i trust artists and go from there. Start there. Brilliant. So, so part of we're, so we're weaving in all these principles, right? We talked about multi-year funding. We talked about building relationships, streamlining paperwork, kind of building in dialogue. A lot of what we're talking about also is about being responsive to the needs that we hear, and transparency and responsiveness kind of go hand in hand as one of the core practices. Um, and Sonia, I want to come back to you. You know, the, the creation, the founding of Color Congress is inherently responsive to the needs that you see in the field. Uh, but I've also noticed that, that you and Sahar have taken a really intentional approach and in being very transparent about what your, what your funding priorities are so as, as not to waste time for prospective applicants. Can you share just like your process of being a transparent grant maker and what, what you're learning as a result of that? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I just, you know, just, I want to just say, you know, I, I'm humbly joining this conversation. Um, we are not yet, we, we are, we, we're in the midst of, um, of an open call, our first open call as an entity. I mentioned we just launched uh, a couple of weeks ago. So we are still at the, you know, you know, we're babies in this work and, 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 and the folks on this panel, my colleagues here are really the visionaries that we are looking to. Um, and learning from. So I'm really grateful to be in, in this conversation. You know, we just opened our um, open call for letters of inquiry um, for the, these unrestricted grants. It closes on Monday. If you have any grantees or, or, or organizations that you think should um, apply, please let us know. 
And so we, you know, Sahara and I really sat with all of the six TVP principles and did an internal audit essentially of every, the entire design of Color Congress before we launched to try to back into, and actually not, not even back into, grow out of that, um, that ethos. And so we thought a lot about um, how we're showing up. We thought a lot about what the process of grant making will be, how it will be experienced by, um, by organizations that we know are not only cash strapped, they're time strapped. Um, and so we tried to devise a process that was as streamlined, as transparent as possible. Um, we encouraged folks to take an eligible, a five question eligibility checklist before submitting an LOI. We have that on our website. Um, we want to make sure you're not putting in any effort if, if you're not in, 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 within the realm that um, is, is up for funding. We streamlined the, um, the application questions. We tried to get everything to under five questions, period. We were really trying hard to make this as easy as possible for the grant seeker. We created an FAQ. We put all of the questions that we think are gonna come up on our website. We also did a webinar. We shared that um, webinar with prospective grantees. We translated all of our materials into Spanish. We offered ASL and CART transcription for a greatest accessibility. Um, we put on our website the timeline for the decision-making process. We listed the advisory board members who are colleagues of all of ours in the field who will have final sign-off on those grants. We tried to think of every possible way that we are being opaque or could be opaque as grant makers and try to make um, that process transparent. Um, as much as possible. Um, if we could share what we're eating for breakfast and that would help a grant seeker <laughs> consider how to approach, we would do it. We really are. We, we really see ourselves as leading from within this um, ecosystem and we are engaging partners who really are friends and colleagues of ours to make the process as simple as possible. That, thank you for those very clear and practical um, just examples of transparency. I think it also just says a lot about those of us who've been on the grant seeking side, really putting ourselves in the shoes of prospective applicants, because we've been on that side, we know what that's like. And I think that's um, just such a valuable contribution to the field. Um, we are about, we oh, we've got four minutes. Um, so here's what I'd like to do with our remaining time. I would love to just go around our panel and just hear each of you just offer one insight um, or offering, especially for our funder colleagues who are listening in today, who are thinking intentionally about how they can use their role in redistributing power and supporting artists and arts organizations. And this can be anything. You can touch upon one of the principles that we haven't addressed yet um, and, and however you wanna to respond to it, but really thinking about what is one piece of advice or an example you'd like to leave our, um, our participants today with um, before we close out. Um, and I'm gonna cut, start with you, Molly. Um, and, and I actually, I had a specific question for you, but I'm gonna hold back and just let you share what, what you feel moved to share. Okay. Um, I'm kind of, you know, sparked by the um, previous conversation and how it ties into meaningful relationships and the relational aspect and importance that you talked about, um, Shadi. Because um, yeah, we did away with um, reports for the impact kickstart. Um, we do it verbally in part because we had done a million reports and thought over and over um, that this could be conveyed in a conversation. And that we, um, when we're working with independent filmmakers who are often holding down multiple jobs, um, and you know, are um, doing the work at the same time that um, we're both building relationship, but we're also uh, gaining all the information and our priority is to have them define impact informed by those who are directly um, experiencing the issues that their films elevate. So I guess just that um, emphasizing the relational depth and value um, that you also foster um, in addition to not just um, freeing up um, you know, that, that work on their end. Um, the other thing that I feel like we haven't touched on is the importance of feedback for those who don't receive grant funding. We have a really, I think, critical documentation process in the review 
where we um, take notes and we also discuss it and we do um, and close out with those who made the decision, just clarifying that we have all the input. And I realize that that can take um, a lot of time uh, for funders, but I also think like if we're truly going to um, seek to diversify those who are going to have access to funds and are uh, able to do so, and just to be accountable to those um, you know, who have spent all this time seeking funds and in the process with us, that um, that's just crucially important. And it's been such a positive process. And those that we've given feedback to have come on to be success, you know, like grantees that we, we later worked with. Um, so again, that's that's relational work also. Um, but I think it, it advances um, progress for all of us. That's so brilliant. Thank you, Molly. There's real rigor in the relationship building as you're describing. Um, Danae, how about you? What are What's one offering or words of wisdom you'd like to leave for folks today? I think one offering would be very quickly top line as something that was really meaningful for us, which is a convening series that we have been um, conducting for infrastructure grantees over 2021. Um, we worked with a facilitator and uh, administered this as a foundation administered project. We had three live engagements with grantees over the course of the year where grantees were, were compensated for their participation. And the main goal was to provide supported space for connection between grantees, um, but also to allow for a two-way channel of conversation, as I mentioned at the top, so that we could gather recommendations for ourselves and funders like us directly from grantees and ensure that these were documented and acted upon. Mm -hmm. So through focus groups, uh, which engaged on topics like sustainability and reinforcing field bud collaborations, we were able to capture direct requests. The resulting commitments were brought back to the rest of our prospective fund team after each session. We were able to grapple with what had been shared and to ask follow-up questions of grantees in the, in the subsequent sessions and to be transparent about our questions, our concerns and our bandwidth. And all of this culminated, culminated in a list of recommendations made by our grantees that have not only influence the topics of conversation for the convenings, but have changed some of our own internal practices. And we were clear about what changes would be immediate, which would take more time and why. And I think, I hope that one of the main commitments that we've made is to continue to do this, to continue this practice, to continue to make space for grantees to express what they need from us mm -hmm. um, and to act on it in real time and hold ourselves accountable. It's been very meaningful for us and of course requires trust on both sides, which is an ongoing process, but it has been, it has been certainly worth the risk. Thank you, I love that. Eleanor, one parting piece of advice or offering for our group today. Sure, I'll, I'll be really fast. I'm gonna go big picture. So my guiding uh, vision is nothing about us without us is for us. And equity is about access. So how ask yourself, how are you creating a culture of access, uh, decreasing barriers? transparency, all of the things embraced by trust-based philanthropy. Um, and just know that through relationship building, through connection, trust is seeded. That's the starting point. I love it. Sonia, you get the final word to close us out for today. <laughs> Well, I, I, I love that, Eleanor. Everything you say is like, I want to tattoo it on my arm. I, you know, I, I just want to thank you, Shadi, for, for so thoughtfully and brilliantly introducing these practices into the documentary sector, a sector I know that you love. Um, it's, it's, it's really incredible that, that you are, are such a great um, ambassador of this new, of this grant making practice and, and an ambassador for filmmaking um, and accountable filmmaking. So I'm just really appreciative of all the time that you put into um, pulling together this gathering, um, this collegial space. And I would just say, you know, this movement that's happening right now in our field is really be being driven by individuals coming together. Um, with like-minded folks, with folks who are who 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 do the same work, um, or um, and are approaching changes in, in the same way. This is a the, this is a moment of collective organizing and collective shifts. 
as grant makers, we are an entity that can be building with one another, can create more learning spaces so we can share ideas, so we can consider our positionality, so we can consider our power and thinking about how we are um, reshaping the norms and the protocols that we received when we came into this field. So I I'm excited to continue this conversation with so many of you to see you all as peers, as grant making peers, and to think about how we can continue to reshape this field towards more equity and access. So mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you, everyone. If you want more, please fill out our survey. Um, we'll send the recording out. Thank you to our amazing panelists. Thank you to Sahar and Katie for the research presentation. And thank you all for sticking with us late. Uh, appreciate you. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.